With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, hour two. Greetings, conversationalists across the fruited plain. It is Eric Erickson here. I am delighted to have you with me. The phone number is 877-973-7425. As promised, some of you would like to weigh in on the farce we witnessed last night, and I am very happy to do that. Uh, I want to play one more piece of audio for you before we go on. And this was, it was nice to hear one of the candidates bring this up last night. It was DeSantis on the Chinese cultural influence in America. And the reason why we're in this mess is because elites in D.C. for far too long have chosen surrender over strength when it comes to the CCP. Some people in our country got rich, our industrial base got hollowed out, and they have been able to build the second most powerful military in the entire world. We need a totally new approach to China. We are going to have real hard power in the Indo Pacific, like Reagan, to deter their ambitions. We're going to have economic independence from China, where we're decoupling our economy, and we are going to go after the cultural power they have in this country. As governor of Florida, I ban the CCP from buying land in our state. We should do that all across these United States. We shouldn't have them in our universities. We shouldn't have Confucius Institutes. Amen. We've got to get rid of the Confucius Institutes, and good for DeSantis saying that. 877-973-7425. Alex, you're going to be up first. Welcome. Hey, Eric, how are you doing today? Great. How are you? Doing well. So last night's debate was terrible, but it's not just last night's debate. Um, And so what I would do to fix the debates is each candidate gets a one minute opening, starting with the first candidate on the far left. And then when you get to the question session, each candidate gets asked the exact same questions that are policy based questions. For the first question, the first candidate to answer is chosen at random, and then you just go down the line for each subsequent question. The next candidate starts the answering process. There's no rebuttal during this period. They get 90 seconds to respond, no rebuttals. And then at the very end, you give each candidate 90 seconds to two minutes for a closing and any rebuttal that they want to give. First candidate is selected at random for that, and then you just go straight down the line. Yeah, look, I, I think that'd be far better than what they did yesterday, um, if far better. And I, I, I wish they would allow opening and closing statements as well. Uh, give the candidates some moment where – and by the way, you know the dirty secret of, of the opening and closing statements is when they prepare the opening and closing statements – it actually then discourages them from trying to remember the zingers and the one-liners because they got to remember their rehearsed opening and closing statement. It gives them less time to try to do the rehearsed lines elsewhere. So you actually tend to have a better debate with the rehearsed opening and closing statements. Uh, I, I exactly. they, they should. Is, what was that? Yeah, my thing is my 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 biggest thing is when they just ask each candidate you, uh, one question and then they go to a, another candidate for a different question. It makes it hard to actually see what the differences are between the candidates. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, you know, so one of the questions that I asked when the candidates were were at my uh, forum was, why you, not them? And they all gave good answers to why go with them as opposed to the other candidates. It was largely built on their records. And it was great. And we need some sort of clarifying moment like that because, you know, and Alex, thanks for the phone call. You ask them about generally any question, by and large, they tend to agree. So find the areas where they can show why them, not the others, and and let them do that. Now, uh, back to the phones. Thomas, you're up next. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, Listen, I'm one of those who is very grateful for what President Trump did and has done for our country, particularly during COVID. But looking forward, let me ask you this. 
has there ever been or could this be viable that Nikki Haley and Tim Scott or vice versa, Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, for instance, were to uh, have a pre-ticket and say, like, Nikki Haley, if you elect me, you know, he'll be my vice president. Or Tim Scott, if he's the Republican nominee, Nikki Haley might be. Has that ever been done before, or could it be viable? The the closest it's come was towards the end of 2016 when Ted Cruz uh, and Carly Fiorina tried to do it to stop Trump. Um, Generally, it's not done. Um, It's probably something they should consider this time. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that it's typically not done. However, uh, the specific example you gave uh, can't work. There's a quirk in the Constitution. The same as you know, a lot of people say, well, why don't we just get Trump to Santos? Uh, I think that bridge is burned at this point. But yeah, here's the reason that doesn't work. So under the Constitution, and I think it's in the 11th Amendment, I think it's the 11th that does this. You can't have two candidates from the same state run for president. Uh, and and vice president. You have to have the presidential party and the vice presidential party have to be from separate states. Now, it can technically be done. You're not prohibited from doing it. You are penalized by doing it. Under the American Constitution, if two candidates run as president and vice president from the same state, That state's votes don't count in the Electoral College. So it makes it easier for the other side to win the Electoral College. So I forget offhand, well, you know what, I I got my computer right here. How many Electoral College votes South Carolina? Uh, South Carolina has... Oh, come on. It should be easier than that. And I should know it off the top of my head anyway, but I don't. But in any event, South Carolina's electoral college votes would be excluded from so nine. They've got nine electoral college votes. So you need 270 to win. You have to have 270. You have to have a majority of the electoral college. Excluding South Carolina does not now reduce the electoral college by nine. It keeps it at 270 to win. And you now have nine less on your side. So since Haley and Scott are from a bright red state, the Republicans would already be at a nine-vote deficit in the Electoral College. If it was Trump and DeSantis, they're both from Florida, that would put them at a 30-point deficit in the Electoral College because uh, they're both uh, – Florida has 30 Electoral College votes now. So that's that's the problem. Uh, it is a quirk in the Constitution a lot of people don't understand is there. That's why, by the way, in the year 2000 – When George Bush and Dick Cheney decided to run, Cheney had to fly to Montana and move his voter registration and residency back to Wyoming because he had moved. He was the CEO of Halliburton, so he'd moved his residency to Texas. So he had to pack up, move to Wyoming uh, in order for the Bush-Cheney ticket to work. Um, An absolute quirk in the Electoral College within the Constitution people don't realize are there, uh, and it is the 11th Amendment of the Constitution, if you want to look it up for yourself, uh, that has the text there. Now, uh, Barry, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the show. Eric, uh, let me ask you a question about uh, uh, these town hall. How about a town hall meeting? Yeah. Where where, Where you go directly to the to the, uh, you know, the people of the United States of America, you know, a citizen of the United States, a, a voting citizen of the United States of America that can ask a question. Why do we have to have a a monitor that is a, you know, a news person that's asking news questions to these candidates? It, 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 all it turns into is a, a poop fest, and they're running back arguing with everybody instead of going directly to the people and letting them ask a question from the people to the candidate that they want to ask them, and nobody else says anything. You just let the person answer the question. Then go to another person and let them ask. Yeah, See look, what I'm saying? And have uh, some yeah. kind of a... Ru- Having a moderator whose sole job is to field from, from the crowd, I look, I think that would be better as well. And, and they do those occasionally. The problem here is the Republican National Committee set out the format for the debates. And thus far, they haven't wanted to do a town hall style debate with these candidates. Um, I, there's a, obviously there's there's a conspiracy among some of the candidates that thinks that the RNC did all of this really to help Donald Trump. I don't actually think that's the case. 
But at the same time, I can't blame them for coming up with a conspiracy theory there. It just it, it wasn't the format wasn't good. Having having moderators whose sole job is to field from from the crowd. That's great. You know, the other thing they could do is they could do a random draw pairing. So we're going to do three hours. We're going to do three hours, but it's only going to be three candidates on stage and we're going to shuffle the candidates for these three hours. So we'll randomly draw this first hour, random drawing through a hat. We'll do a big deal of it. Uh, go to the go to the lottery, put the names on ping pongs and let them randomly be shuffled. All right, this hour we're going to get DeSantis, we're going to get Doug Burgum, and we're going to get Vivek Ramaswamy. Next hour we're going to get Tim Scott, Nikki Haley. Uh, we're going to get Mike Pence. Next hour, we're going to get Chris Christie, uh, Will Hurd, and and uh, whoever else I'm missing. We'll, we'll get them on stage. We'll do something like that. Or do two two hours, two, uh, an hour and a half each with sets of four on stage. Something like that. There are ways to do it, uh, to engage the crowd, to make it work, to uh, elicit good answers. But what we saw last night was just unfortunate. Deeply frustrating. By the way, while we're talking about all of this, the House Republicans have begun their impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden. Um, the Republicans are already complaining about their own impeachment inquiry. Why? Because several of the House Republicans' star legal experts have made their opening statement saying there's no reason for um there there's no reason for this impeachment inquiry Jonathan Turley the Republicans star witness has said there is no high crime or misdemeanor that he has found thus far uh one Republican aide is telling CNN quote picking witnesses that refute our arguments for impeachment is mind-blowing this is an unmitigated disaster Jim Jordan started with a very strong statement. I want to go on and take a time out here because I, I want to be able to play for you uh, at length his opening statement. It was a very strong statement, and I want you to be able to hear it. So I will play Jim Jordan's opening statement. Probably the strongest moment of the day thus far for the GOP was that. You'll hear it when we come back. Guys, if you're a small, mid-sized business, you're struggling with HR issues, you have employees not showing up, or you got to do a termination, you need onboarding of employees, maybe there's a sexual harassment complaint. You want an HR manager. You don't want to be the bad guy with your employees. Bambi can play the role of HR for you. $99 a month, available by phone, email, real-time chat. They do onboardings, terminations. They help your team members get to peak performance. And your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations, regardless of which state. They're great. Now, they're U.S.-based. They You got somebody to talk to who's dedicated to your team they give you access to HR expertise, and they add personal touches. So even though they're outsourced by your company, they really feel like they're a part of your team. That matters. Go to Bambi.com right now. Type in Eric Erickson under podcast. When you sign up, it'll help my show. Bambi.com, B-A-M-B-E-E.com, Bambi.com, Eric Erickson in the podcast tab. Greetings. Welcome. As promised. Jim Jordan opened uh, the impeachment hearings into Joe Biden, and I want you to be able to hear his opening statement, the case he makes that's been ignored by so much of the press. This is Congressman Jim Jordan leading the hearing into the impeachment of Joe Biden. And this is a tale as old as time. Politician takes action that makes money for his family, and then he tries to conceal it. Never forget four fundamental facts. Hunter Biden gets put on the board of Burisma, gets paid a lot of money. Hunter Biden's not qualified, fact number two, to sit on the board. Not my words, his words. He said he got on the board because of the brand, because of the name. Fact number three, the executives at Burisma ask Hunter Biden to weigh in and help them with the pressure they are under from the prosecutor in Ukraine. Fact number four, Joe Biden goes to Ukraine on December 9th, 2015, gives this speech attacking the prosecutor that starts the process of getting that guy fired. Those facts, by the way, are consistent with what the confidential human source told the FBI and the FBI recorded in the 1023 form, the same form that the Justice Department didn't want to let this committee see. And all those facts, all of that was further confirmed yesterday 
with the information that the Ways and Means Committee released from the whistleblowers Shapley and Ziegler. Here's a communication from Hunter Biden to an executive with Burisma. Devin and I do feel comfortable with Blue Star strategy, the, uh, strategies and the ability of Sally and Karen to deliver. Hunter Biden put Burisma in, in touch with Blue Star strategies. What were they going to deliver? Well, that was in a communication released yesterday as well. U.S. officials in Ukraine and in the United States need to express support for Burisma and Nikolai Zalsevsky to the highest level decision makers, the president of Ukraine, the president's chief of staff, and the prosecutor general. That's what they were going to deliver. And was they, were they successful? The interior minister confirmed that Zolachevsky is no longer wanted. We won in less than a year. Communications between the folks at Blue Star and Eric Sherwin, who was Hunter Biden's business partner. Uh, uh, partner. Awesome work. Congratulations to you guys. Those are the communications. That's what they got done. And remember, when this happens in October 2016... When, they, when the pressure is taken off, the case is dropped against Olachevsky. This is the second prosecutor. Joe Biden fired the first one. The second prosecutor comes in, drops the charges. That's exactly what they wanted done. And the final step, the final step is the Biden Justice Department tries to sweep it all under the rug. They slow walk the investigation. They let the statute of limitations lapse for the most important years, 14 and 15, the Burisma years when all that income's coming in. They try to put together this sweetheart deal and get it past the judge. And we learned yesterday in the search warrant, applica- in the search warrant examining Hunter Biden's electronic communications, they weren't allowed to ask about political figure one. Political figure number one is the big guy, is Joe Biden. And they would have gotten away with it all. They would have gotten away with it all except for two brave whistleblowers who sat in those seats two months ago and told their story. And their story has stood up. Two brave whistleblowers and a judge in Delaware who said, we're not going to let this happen. That's why we're here today. That's why this inquiry is so darn important. It's it's the oldest story in the world, and those are the facts. That's Jim Jordan. He is congressman from Ohio, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and he is in charge of the impeachment inquiry. And that's his opening statement laying out their path forward. Now, there is a problem in that the Republicans' own key witnesses today are saying there's not a there there. That's not me saying that this is the Republican staffers complaining that the people who have been invited by the GOP, including constitutional lawyer Jonathan Turley, are saying there's no evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors uh, by Joe Biden. Um, They're going to have to flesh that out to be able to get there. Um, But so far, it's not good when the Republican witnesses are undermining their own case, and that really is happening uh, today. The Republicans not quite happy with the first day of this. Now, I want you to be happy, and you will be happy if you go to visioncomputers.com and you get yourself a computer from Vision. Instead of going to one of the big box electronic stores or going to one of those online places that ships all over the country, Vision is where you need to go and call them at 404-COMPUTE. Ask about the Eric Erickson special. They'll actually save you even more money. You're going to save money to begin with as opposed to going to one of those generic big box stores. You're going to get the computer you want and need that's upgradable, expandable, and keeps up to date for longer than one of those generic boxes that you can get. They can do a laptop. They can do a desktop. And then the genius of the system is that if you use Vision Computers, they're also your IT department for your home or your office. They will help you with your computer. If you don't have a computer from Vision, you can pay them a small annual fee, and they'll still be your IT department. They can do this for your home, for your family's computer, or they can do it for your office. And your office computers, each member of your staff can call Vision to be able to figure out what's going on. They can remote in in many cases to deal with your computer. Uh, They can talk to you over the phone and help you navigate it. They're great. They can do printer support, email support, virus support, software installs, distance uninstalls, all that. VisionComputers.com, but better yet, call them at 404 Compute. You won't find the Eric Erickson special online. 404 Compute, anywhere nationwide. Ask about the Eric Erickson special. 404 Compute, Vision Computers. Greetings, welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. We must talk about 
the potential of a government shutdown. At the debate last night, Ron DeSantis was asked about this and said this. It's in our interest to end this war, and that's what I will do as president. We are not going to have a blank check. We will not have U.S. troops, and we're going to make the Europeans do what they need to do. But they've sent money to pay uh, bureaucrats' pensions and salaries and funding small businesses halfway around the world. Meanwhile, Our own country is being invaded. Uh, We don't even have control of our own territory. We have got to defend the American people before we even worry about all these other things. And I watch these guys in Washington, D.C., and they don't care about the American people. They don't care about the fentanyl deaths. They don't care about the communities being overrun because of this border. They don't care about the Mexican drug cartels. So as commander in chief, I will defend this country's sovereignty. That's DeSantis talking about Washington doesn't care. Uh, Just so you understand, one of the big hangups in this continuing resolution and potential government shutdown is the funding with Ukraine. And the private, the public position in the House is no money for Ukraine. The the, the private, the public position is no money. The private position is if you're going to fund Ukraine, that's fine, but we want more border security. Kevin McCarthy went on CNBC this morning to talk about the potential of a government shutdown. You won't give me odds on whether we we shut down, I guess. I mean, people are at like 80 percent now, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> 80, I, I, I understand you, you, you want markets if, to roll and do whatever you if can. If I was on DraftKings, if, if I was on DraftKings, where should I put my money for the... Uh, for the, the, the whether the government shuts or not. I, I'm leaning Look, toward, I, I, I wake, think the I wake will be up, very, I won't make any, go ahead. I, I wake up every day optimistic. I'd say, put your money on me. We're, we're going to get this done. Now, now, well, I'm not if, counting if you out. Just, that's, that's one thing people say. Like, that's one thing people say, don't count you out. But I'm just talking about whether you're able to wrangle those, uh, those crazy cats on both, crazy cats. That sounds like a beatnik, but those crazy wrangling cats that you're trying to, to accomplish. What are the chances that that finally happens? I don't, I don't well, know. If you, if you want to do it by a clock, I don't know what to give you the odds on a clock. Um, here's the problem. The, well, there there are several problems. The, the House Republicans can only lose four votes. The Senate Republicans want a clean funding resolution. Now, what is a clean funding resolution? That they, they don't want to fight over this continuing resolution in large part because they expect another fight to come. But let's be real honest here. They, they want to cave on that fight too. That's, that's ultimately what's going on here. It's the house Republican or the Senate Republicans. They don't want to fight. They they don't, they don't want to fight. The house Republicans want to fight. The house Republicans recognize we got, we got problems. We've got, um, we, we've got to make a stand. We've got to fight. We've got to control spending. On stage at the debate last night, there were uh, several pointed moments from DeSantis, from Nikki Haley, and from Chris Christie in particular where they attacked Donald Trump for his reckless spending over COVID in his last year, saying essentially that his was the ramp up to inflation that Joe Biden embraced and went even further with sparking even worse inflation. We know something's got to be done. I mentioned yesterday on the program that we now have record revenue in Washington. This year has seen more tax revenue go to Washington, D.C. than at any time in American history. Over $4 trillion in tax revenue has gone to Washington, D.C. Over $4 trillion. So the question then is, if that's the case, why do we need to raise taxes, Democrats? We have record revenue. Why raise taxes? We we got to find somewhere to cut. And then there's the other problem, and that problem is the bond market. I'm not an expert on this. I need to get my buddy Dave Nicholas to come on and, and talk to us about it. Um, we may have to reach out to Dave and, and see if we can get him on. Um, the, so the yield that the government pays... Is, that's the interest rate. So the, you've got almost a 5% uh, bond rate right now. 
that means that the government is paying 5% interest on the bonds that are being bought by consumers for treasury debt, and that's very high right now. For every dollar that is spent servicing the national debt, that's a dollar that's not spent on any of the discretionary items of the government. You know, the government budget has uh, mandatory spending. That is, they've got to pay the interest of, that's on the bonds. They've got to pay Social Security. They've got to pay Medicare and Medicaid. Those are fixed costs within the government. Everything else is discretionary. The defense budget is discretionary. The veterans department, discretionary. Education spending, discretionary. Foreign aid, discretionary. The agriculture budget, discretionary. The road budget, discretionary. The amount of money spent on national parks, discretionary. It's all discretionary spending. It is going to we're going to create a situation where we have less and less money to spend on all that discretionary stuff. We're not going to be able to fund the military because we're going to have so much to pay on the national debt. We're not going to be able to fund education, not a bad thing actually. Because of the money spent on on the national debt, we're not going to be able to fund border security. We're going to have to cut. If you were to take everybody's money, take everybody's money and give it to Washington, you still wouldn't pay off the debt. So what are we going to cut? At some point, we have to cut something, and Washington doesn't seem to know what they want to cut. The Democrats in particular don't want to cut anything, and they want to demonize Republicans for even cutting the rate of growth. Not not real cuts. They demonize the Republicans for just cutting the rate of growth, and that's deeply problematic. We, we've got to actually engage to figure out a way to pay down the debt. And one way you do that, one of the big ways you do that is economic growth. See, what you do is by growing the economy, you grow the nation's GDP. By growing the nation's GDP, you shrink the ratio of debt to GDP. You make the debt more manageable. And then you start cutting things in government and you begin to reduce the national debt. You don't have deficits that pile up every year and the, have the deficits roll over into the national debt. There are ways to do this intelligently, but we get very little conversation on it. Let's go to the phones. Rick, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the show, Rick. Hey, uh, I'd like to know your opinion, seeing that our government really doesn't care, neither side. Why do they bring up the deficit? Because... We're never going to pay it, and I think everybody in the world knows that we're not going to pay it. We're just going to continue printing the money, and everything is just going to completely keep going up. So what is your take? Well, okay, so that, that's that's part of the problem here, Rick, and thanks for the phone call, is at some point it becomes unserviceable, so you do have to stop. Um, an alcoholic... Uh, eventually gets cirrhosis of the liver and dies. A drug addict overdoses and dies. A spending addict like Washington, D.C. goes bankrupt. Now, governments technically can't go bankrupt, but they default on their loans, and when they default on their loans, they collapse their economy. And that's the problem. Um, we've, we've got to we got to deal with this. Nationally, we have to deal with this. Nationally, we're going to have to come to terms with it. Uh, now, it is it is possible for them to change course. Bill Clinton and the Republicans did it. Bill Clinton and the Republicans in the late 90s balanced the budget. Bill Clinton and the Republicans put together a plan that, that cut government and balanced it, and we did not contribute to the national debt. It's possible to do. Do you want to know the easiest way to do it? I'm not kidding. You know the easiest way to do it is go with the 2019 spending levels. The year before COVID, if we spent that money and that was our budget framework, we wouldn't add to the debt. Because of the rate of inflation, the rate of economic growth, and the rate of money into the government, you could spend at the 2019 levels 
and and you could largely break even. Actually, I take that back. I'm looking at the number right now. You you would add a little bit to the deficit, but not a lot. I mean, we're adding trillions of dollars right now. You would not add two hundred billion dollars. You go to 2019 and you hold that level for a couple of years. And suddenly, you're not growing the deficit at all, given the rate of money coming into the government, uh, give, given the flow of cash. Were we hurting in 2019? 2019 was our last good economic year before COVID. You just run those numbers, pass those numbers. See, what happens with the continuing resolution is they bump up the numbers every year. They bump up the numbers by a small percentage every year. They fund everything a little bit more. They occasionally restructure. They don't pass a budget. They don't pass appropriations bills. They just pass the continuing resolution, and they inflate the numbers every year. So last year we spent uh, $5 trillion. This year we're going to spend $6 trillion. Next year we'll spend $7 trillion. The next year we'll spend $8 trillion. We're, we're spending more money than we're bringing in. We're, we're bringing in $4.89 trillion. Our federal budget should only be $4.89 trillion. If you go back to the 2019 appropriations, that is about a $5 trillion spending package. So you're, you're adding with it $4.89, $4.9 trillion. You're adding a, a $100 to $200 billion to the national debt. But if you hold the line at $5 trillion, uh, based on our economic projections, next year we'll be bringing in about $5 trillion in uh, money. So if you hold the line for two years in a row with no increases in the federal government, the next year you, you got you got a net zero deficit, which means you haven't added anything. So if you hold the line at $5 trillion for the third year in a row, federal money has gone up again to $5.2 trillion based on projections. Suddenly, you've got $200 billion surplus, and suddenly your national debt is no longer greater than your GDP. There are ways to do it. There are ways to do it, and we've done it before. Democrats and Republicans have come together before and done it. The problem now is that the Democrats of the 1990s are dead, and the Democrats of today have embraced modern monetary theory, which argues you can print print money till the cows come home and you don't have to worry about inflation. And it's what got us into this reckless inflationary mess. That's the problem. Thankfully, we've got great groups like Patriot Mobile pushing back against this nonsense. They are funding conservative candidates to fight against this recklessness in Washington, D.C. They want you on their side. All you got to do is go to PatriotMobile.com slash Eric today. Take your business to Patriot Mobile. What are they? They're a cell phone company. You move your cell phone service to them. You can move your phone number to them. You get guaranteed great service, probably using the same cell towers you're already using. And then on top of that... They fund the candidates and causes you as a conservative care about because they are explicitly a Christian conservative company. There are other cell phone companies that try to claim that they're doing this. Patriot Mobile is explicitly designed to be a Christian conservative company funding the Second Amendment cause, the pro-life movement, conservative candidates battling wokes on school boards. They want you on their team. Go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric or call them 972-PATRIOT, 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you and you get free activation with my name. You just move your cell phone number to them, or they'll give you a brand new phone number if you want one. You get guaranteed great service. You do business with people who share your values, and they fund the causes you care about. As their profits grow, their spending in the conservative movement grows. PatriotMobile.com slash Eric or 972-PATRIOT. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. The phone number 877-973-7425. I got to go back to this clip I played earlier. Chris Christie engaged with the whole survivor thing at the end. But there was this funny moment where he looks over at Vivek and says, put your hand down for a second. I believe I did see you write something on the card. Who no, was it? <laughs> no, but I'll certainly tell you. Go. Okay. Yeah. Look, I think I've been the only one on this stage who's been clear about this. I vote Donald Trump off the island right now. And the reason I vote him off the island... You will and there were, and by, any of the, no, of the people no, on the stage you know what? Him. Every person on this stage has shown the respect for Republican voters to come here, to express their views honestly, candidly, and directly, and to take your questions honestly. I have respect for every man and woman on this stage because they've done it. Vivek, put your hand down for a second, would you? Um... <laughs> Okay, so um, there's an ESPN uh, personality, Pablo Torre, and he went to Harvard with Vivek and has this hilarious story he shared on his podcast about his hand-raising in college. 
as Vivek Ramaswamy in college when we were both freshmen was famous on campus for his alter ego 20 years ago. Mm. And his alter ego was a libertarian rapper <laughs> that he called Da Vic. Go so loud, he opens his mouth, but the words won't come out. He's joking how, everybody's joking now. The clock's run out, time's up, over, plow, snap back to reality. Da Vic? D-A. Okay. Da Vic. Even like when I think back at our time together at Harvard, um, Vivek and I wound up taking the same moral philosophy class as freshmen also. And in lecture, I vividly remember, I've been joking about this for 20 years too. In lecture, a lecture class with like hundreds of students in it, Vivek would raise his hand all of the time. He would raise it conspicuously in the shape of a V. Like he That's was even worse. Wow. shining a bat signal, his own bat signal for terrible libertarian tics. <laughs> wow. Well, raising your hand in the shape of a V. <laughs> wow. Oh, Vivek. Uh, and then his hair last night, it continues to grow taller. Um, wow. That's that's pretty funny. Uh, definitely a personality. Def- definitely a funny personality. He was much more restrained on stage last night. I think he realized he overplayed his hand. In the first debate, he came across as as rather unlikable, particularly to the seasoned citizens who watched the debate. He came across as like a know-it-all, smarty-pants bully. I mean, don't take my word for it. I mean, that was the feedback from the seasoned citizen focus groups. They didn't like him. Um. He was a little more subdued until until the attacks ramped up on him last night. Um, it is just very clear that the other, you know the dirty little secret of why the other candidates don't care for him is because they actually see him as a proxy for Trump. That that he's running to help Donald Trump to aid and abet Trump. They they see him as a a quasi Trump presence on the stage designed uh, to please Donald Trump. That's that's the whole issue that they're dealing with. There is is that's how they perceive him. Um, all right. When we come back, I, I, I'm going to blow your mind with a story from City Journal on how public schools in California have really, really consciously decided that they're no longer going to teach kids reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, they're going to teach them the LGBTQIA pluses. Oh, wait. I'll explain when we come back. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group. Void prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.